Art is one of those aesthetic qualities which can be described but never adequately defined. I believe Henry Moore or somebody said that art was whatever makes life better in a qualitative sense, not a quantitative one. It is one of those ingrained facets of our existence which can help us balance ourselves in a world which often may be too technocratic or cold. Art can or should remind us of our humanity and that of others and help us appreciate that humanity more deeply. the king of Afghanistan commissioned my father to build the first engineering school in the country. The first few years of my life were spent there, then in India and Thailand points in between. I lived 18 years overseas and circled the world eight times before graduating school in Bangkok. My parents were artists and took us into museums and galleries all over the world. I remember looking up at Michelangelo's Moses in Rome when I was six or so and being deeply moved. I studied teak wood carving in Thailand with a Buddhist monk when I was 14 and was exposed to quite a bit of classical oriental as well as European art. Sculpture is the art of creating and manipulating shadows. In ancient Greece, a sculpture was critiqued by someone slowly moving around it on a dark night with a small candle and observing the play and movement of shadow across its surface. I make my own clay and enjoy the freedom of a good oil-based clay. I can hang an arm or a bit of hair in space and move it around until it works without being confined by my material. For me, sculpting is a thing of exploration and discovery. I often have only a vague idea of what I want when I begin a piece. It's a bit like a partnership between artist and clay with neither dictating to the other but rather suggesting than waiting to see what happens. It's a bit like a bonsai artist who suggests things to a miniature tree using selective sunlight, water, splicing, or binding, or whatever, without knowing exactly what the tree will do with those suggestions. Pure art is never just direction, but direction coupled with something else. Art to me is a thing of communication, and I work until I feel the piece genuinely communicates something worthy of preserving in bronze. When a sculpture is finished, when I feel I can't or shouldn't alter or enhance it further, then the technical side begins. 
There are over 60 separate steps and nine major operations to producing a bronze sculpture. The original clay is cut up into manageable sections dictated by mold considerations, bronze pouring limitations, and ease of assembly. The objective is to make production of the bronze as smooth as possible without altering the integrity of the original form. A parting line or clay platform is built around each disassembled piece with indexing pins and holes or rods and grooves to ensure perfect lineup of mold halves. A wall is built around the unit to prevent spillage and liquid rubber, usually a silicone, polysulfide or polyurethane, is weighed and mixed with a catalyst and painted on the clay original. Trapped air bubbles are blown out with compressed air and the rubber is painted up to the high points and allowed to run down into the lows until it sets or hardens in approximately an hour. Additional coats are applied with cheesecloth reinforcement between them until a thickness of one eighth to a quarter of an inch is achieved. A mother mold is constructed of fiberglass or plaster, then the unit is turned over and the process is repeated on the other side. The mold is open, the original clay removed, and after cleaning, the mold is ready for use. A refined casting wax is melted to 250 degrees and painted or poured into the mold. The inside of the mold is uniformly coated with wax by sloshing or turning, after which the excess is poured out. This is repeated until a desired thickness is reached, then the wax is allowed to cool to room temperature and removed from the mold. The cast wax positive must then be repaired or chased. Mold seam lines must be erased, air bubble holes filled, or anything else required to return the wax to the original form. The completed wax is then sprued or gated by attaching wax rods to it. The wax rod will, after burnout, be tunnels through which molten bronze is introduced to the cavity and exhaust gases are evacuated. The rods also serve as reservoirs that feed the casting as metal cools and contracts. The gated wax is then dipped in a ceramic slurry, a creamy liquid of silica particles, 400 microns in diameter, suspended in water. Drained, then stuccoed with fine, then coarse silica sand. The ceramic mold or shell is allowed to dry for 24 hours, then dipped and stuccoed again. Six to 12 coats are usually applied to bring the shell to a thickness of one quarter to one half inches thick. The completed shell is then flashed by subjecting it to 1800 degrees heat, a burnout oven. 
This fuses the ceramic shell and burns out the wax, leaving a hollow cavity. 20 pound bronze ingots are melted in a crucible in the melt furnace and heated to 2,200 degrees or so. This is the heart of this ancient craft, almost a modern alchemy, which began in the Tigris Euphrates River Valley thousands of years ago. Tools and technology have improved, but the basic idea of lost wax casting is the same. When the bronze is ready to pour, the shells are removed from the oven, placed in a pouring box, and packed with sand to insulate and support them. The bronze is then poured into the shells. After being allowed to cool slowly to room temperature, the castings are pulled from the box, the shell broken and removed, and the process of metal chasing begins. Metal chasing refers to everything needed to bring a rough casting to a finished state. From grinding, sanding, assembly by welding with the same metal alloy, grinding, burnishing, whatever. Bronze is a hard, durable metal which, in the Bronze Age, was used for swords and shields and helmets, and now is used for ships, propellers, and bushings for drive shafts. A good metal craftsman can destroy or protect the surface and form of the original art. Patina is the coloring by mild corrosives and fire of the chased bronze. The old timers sometimes used to bury a bronze two feet deep in the ground, urinate on that spot for two weeks, then dig it up and clean off the dirt. The combination would give a beautiful deep brown color. Genuine patina is not paint, but rather a crystalline oxidation or rust. Different mild acids produce different colored copper oxides. The finished patina is then sealed or protected by a coat of paste wax and the bronze is done and ready for delivery and setup.
Somerset Maugham wrote that art is a manifestation of emotion, and emotion is the language that everyone speaks. I personally feel that art is not a luxury, but rather one of the basic human necessities. From the earliest artists, the storytellers around a fire in a cave, to the shaping of bronze today, art has pervaded our societies. Art is a way of encapsulating empathy and inducing or sharing that empathy with others, living or centuries yet to be born. Without a healthy mechanism for sensing and sharing our feelings of beauty, of fears, desires, moralities, atrocities, successes, or whatever, the individual and then the society withers and dies. All of us are artists in our own way. Some of us choose to speak only to ourselves or to families. Others choose or are called to speak to a wider audience. I don't feel that what we call an artist is a type of creator, but is rather a conduit, absorbing a message or a feeling and interpreting and relaying it in some form so that many others on down the line can benefit from that interpretation. The quality of the art should be determined by the importance and the emotional clarity of that interpretation.
mid-1980s, a group of us got together and founded Rancho Feliz. Uh, that means Happy Ranch in Spanish. It's a nonprofit charity group to support people that are unable to help themselves. We built several orphanages and support them. We built a soup kitchen that feeds about 500 kids two hot meals a day if they go to school. We've done numerous operations from cleft palate to hearing sight, burn victims, uh, whatever's needed. We built a 43 duplex housing development with community areas, fiesta areas, classrooms, elder centers, and a world-class daycare center. Over the years, we've done a lot of famine relief work and saved tens of thousands of lives. I've been Santa Claus for over 20 years. That experience has been a lot to me. The artist is temporary and transient, but the art goes on. The song is always more important than the singer. The song will find other singers on down the road and other drummers for other marchers. Like the great whales who pass their songs on down through the generations, modifying them here and there, the important thing is that we go on singing. Now I'm going to ask John Soderbergh and his daughter, Misty, if they would come forward to this side of the statues. was five or six, I was in the Garden of Gethsemane standing next to a tree that the guide said was alive when Christ was there. Um, I was in Lazarus's tomb and I grew up in places where hunger and starvation are common. So the story was always very special to me about feeding people and uh, dealing with the physical hunger as well as the spiritual. Uh, patrons make it happen and I really do want to thank Frank and Evelyn Freed and Dr. Schuler for their patronage, their belief in me and in art in general. Thank you.